Home Factory, we run up the flag. Then we get ourselves in a sticky situation. And we find ourselves puzzled. But first, we spin a yarn about yarn. You want to know what's cool? All right. Knitting is cool. And no one knows it better than Spin Right Yarn. This is the capital of cool. Spin Right Yarn's 210,000 square foot facility in Listowel, Ontario. And this is John Verway, operations manager at Spin Right. He's here to tell us what is hip. It's hip to knit. And he also knows what's cool. And it's cool to crochet. Why is that then, John? And I'm a big Star Trek fan. Oh, no. I've actually seen on Star Trek where they have people knitting. So even in the 24th century, it's going to happen. OK, but here in the 21st century, let's talk about how knitting has become cool again. Knitting has always been cool. It's just for a lot of people who've been back in the closet a little bit. Well, not anymore. Spinrite boasts the most extensive product line in the yarn industry. And that starts here, with the arrival of 360 kilogram bales of 100% raw acrylic fibers. Those fibers are fed into a machine for gilling, which straightens them out and blends them all together to make a uniform color. Gilling is overseen by Tom. Hi, I'm Tom. I've been here since 91. So we're guessing he's a bit of a master of the gilling machine. Hell no. I just do my job. Kind of. The gilling machine pulls the raw fibers through a series of combs which straighten the strands. The strands are then outputted into these spinning bins, ready for phase two, roving. Roving just prepares the wool for spinning, strengthening it, and cleaning it of any debris. Okay, so let's start roving with the purple yarn. It's drawn from the drums over a sequence of parallel rollers. These rub the fibers, adding a twist and making them stronger. This is Arlene. Arlene enjoys knitting a lot. Arlene's been knitting for quite some time. I was knitting when knitting was cool. Psst, Arlene, it's cool again, remember? Arlene is responsible for replacing the full roving reels with fresh ones, which is happening, well, pretty much right now. Okay, I gotta go. I gotta go get that. Arlene grabs the full yarn reels and loads them into a hopper for transportation to spinning. Where they meet Susanna. Yeah, she's quite the spinning fan. At Spinrite, they produce 72 million balls of yarn every year. That's a lot of spinning. Well, let's get to it then. Spinning makes the yarn thinner or thicker, depending on what we want to use it for. Today, we're spinning blue yarn. Spools are fixed above the spinner and then unwind through the machine. Once the yarn has been thinned, the threads can be twisted together and re-spooled to the thickness we want. This one spins at around 4,000 RPM, spooling about 550 meters each minute. Next up, steaming, which happens in these steam tunnels at a temperature of 95 degrees Celsius. What the steaming does is it gives the yarn then the ability to fully relax. Very similar to uh, taking a, a sweater and putting it in low heat on a dryer. It tends to just open it up and give it that little bit of fluffiness. The second tunnel dries the yarn and cools it back down to room temperature. This is Paula, who works with the baller. But what should we call her? And I've... Okay, I gotta do that over. My name is Paula, I work in Bali. I... Oh my God, one more, okay, let's get this one better. My name is Paula, I work in Bali, and I like it steamy. The ballers are a number of spindles around which the yarn is wrapped. Today, black yarn. These guys can make up to 50 balls a minute. That's 3,000 per hour, or 72,000 each day. Once full, the yarn ball is ready to be sent to packaging, which happens like this. Go, Dave! Sadly not. This less fun conveyor ferries the yarn balls to a rotating clamp which wraps them in paper and sends them off to be bagged. Those bags are transferred to packing cartons by factory workers. 12 packets of yarn in every carton. Nice, kind of 
kind of wondering with all this yarn around, how many of these folks actually knit? We know Arlene does, right? What about Tom? My wife would tell me I'm doing it wrong. Guess not. Uh, Paula? I'm learning! I myself, I can knit, but you wouldn't want to see the end project. Okay, so between all the knitting and the fun wigs and, well, this, I'm guessing these guys get through a lot of yarn. We'll produce in any one day about 20,000 miles of yarn. That means that in 10 days, we could produce enough yarn to stretch to the moon. Okay, that's useful, I guess, but I'm assuming that means there's also enough to stretch to pretty much every home in Canada. Yeah, I guess so. But who's using all this yarn? Is staying home and knitting the new going out and partying? Well, sure it is. I mean, I've been saying it for years. Friday night is all about the yarn, baby. Quick. Okay. What do you think about when you hear the word Canada? Syrup-covered beavers playing hockey, eh? Uh, okay. Uh, what about the proud Canadian maple leaf? Oh, yeah, that too, that too. And to find out what goes into making a patriotic Canadian flag, we're headed to Flag's Unlimited 65,000 square foot facility in Barrie, Ontario. That's right, and this is Brian Dusum, the team leader of finishing, and he's gonna tell us all about how Flag's Unlimited makes the best flags available. Our flags are superior because of the richness of the color, the finishing detail, and the strength of the product itself. Now the first step for any flag is finalizing the design. But since the Canadian flag already has a pretty fantastic design, it's kind of a slow day in graphics. Okay. Uh, let's fast forward to the printing stage, shall we? This is another Brian. He's going to tell us what's going on in printing. Well, basically, we're printing a Canada flag. No, oh, thank you, Brian. Flags Unlimited uses Duranit 3 for their outdoor flags. The fabric resists fraying, so it's ideal for displaying outside. We print on the best uh, polyester fabric that's available in the marketplace. Flags Unlimited uses water-based ink. The printer uses two rails, each putting down half the color. What it does is it minimizes the amount of uh, bleeding of the dye on the fabric and keep as crisp an image as can be. It also saturates the fabric so the image can be seen from both sides. It kind of looks a little dark to me. Mm. Once it gets into the final process, which is setting the, the color in, it'll make that red pop. It'll be a nice Canada red. And to set that color, the printed fabric goes through a giant set of rollers that pull it past a pair of heaters set to 205 degrees Celsius, which bonds the ink to the fabric. Steamy. Next, the printed and bonded fabric heads to the washing department. This is David, and he's in charge over here. We're washing out the extra dye that's strapped into the uh, webbing. That way it won't bleed or transfer onto the crisp white background. Now, large orders of flags are cut by machine, but specialty orders are cut by hand by Glacelin and her team in the cutting department. Glacelin and the cutting team follow tiny crop marks to cut each flag. The cutters also remove a graphic code that was printed at the same time as the flag, so they can check the dye job, because all of the colors should be perfect. It's supposed to. It should be. Glacelin uses a device called a spectrometer. Ooh. It measures the printed color as light is passed through it to make sure the color is exactly as specified and has it faded or changed since it was printed. Glacelin, how many flags do you check in a day? Oh, I can count lots. <laughs> the flags that pass are sent to the sewing department, where a canvas header is sewn on and then the edges are hemmed. This is Lita in sewing, and she is a vital part of this entire operation and a proud Canadian. Without me, it's not gonna be Canadian flags. <laughs> yeah, sing it, sister. Oh, Canada, da 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 da. <laughs> I don't know that one. Ooh, that's okay, Lita. Next, grommets are punched into the canvas header. Flags Unlimited uses spurred grommets, which means the bottom has spikes. Spurs bite into the fabric and hold themselves tight in that header to withstand all of the air pressure and the wind and the rain and the snow and everything else. Finished flags are folded and put into plastic sleeves with an information card and label. Flags Unlimited produces one million Canadian flags per year. That many flags would cover Prince Edward Island 10 times. Wow. 
Then, the individually wrapped flags are boxed and shipped to retailers where true North Patriots can buy them for their very own homes. Every Canadian household should have one of these Canadian flags. But it's not just Canadian flags that keep Flags Unlimited busy. You can put just about anything on a flag. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Back to the graphics department. And now, to the printers. Heat setting. Washing. Cutting. Color testing. Sewing. Grommeting. And then... Ta-da! Home factory. Our show and paycheck signer. Just brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it? <laughs> Dippity do. Okay, did you just say dippity do as in dippity do hair gel? I dippity did. As in the dippity do sports gel? Don't dippity doubt it. Oh, happy dippity day. Yes, our dippity destination today is the dippity do headquarters in dippity. No, wait, that's not gonna work. In Mississauga, Ontario. And we're here to meet marketing director Maria Mavro Stamos, who's going to tell us what kinds of people like to dippity do it. It's an all around gel for everyone. But uh, the sport gel really appeals to guys, because guys like to think that they're all sporty. <laughs> Did I say that? Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> I'll never get a date ever. Cut. Yep, at an impressive 50 years old. That's the gel, not Maria. And popping up in an estimated 85% of American bathrooms. Still talking about the gel, not Maria. This vintage classic has evolved from mom's must have to an everyday essential for, well, everyone. This is not your mom's gel anymore. I just like that it has the word sport on the bottle. You know, it kind of fits my lifestyle. As soon as we put the name sport on our products, which was more of an active idea, guys thought, aha, that fits my lifestyle. Yeah, see what I'm talking about? So Dippity Doo begins its life as a combination of these white powders called carbomers. Carbomers are used to stop oil and liquid from separating in the finished gel so that the Dippity Doo will have an even consistency. The carbomers are poured into a giant mix kettle. That kettle is actually called a sweep mixer, which just sounds more fancy. Then they're mixed with purified water. So pure, you could probably drink it. The water purification system here is very stringent so that you can have a long shelf life. Polyacrylate polymers are added next. These are able to absorb huge amounts of water, meaning that they give the gel its thickness. Right, the quantities used are super important and super secret. So they're incorporated into the blend using a special dispersing machine. Okay, with the science part done, it's time to add the fun stuff, fragrance. Right, this is Nimit. He's here to describe the magic of the fragrance. We are mixing separately in a separate stainless steel container. Stop. Give us some poetry, Nimit. Poetry. I smell like uh, sports. <laughs> Try one more time. I smell like uh, walking on a mountain. Lovely. So all the ingredients are mixed at a speed of 12 RPM and heated to a temperature of 52 degrees Celsius. When you're in the batching tank and they put it all together and all gels, you can see that, you know, it looks like a great gel and it also smells like dippity doo. <laughs> it does. The mix is cooled down to 35 degrees Celsius, and then it's ready for packaging. Customized nozzles squeeze gel together with air into the bottles. The air gives the gel its iconic bubbly look, which is very important. Yes, very important. <laughs> Those fillers are overseen by Jaspreet. She knows exactly how many bubbles make the perfect hair gel. Maybe it's about okay. Not too much, no good. This machine can fill 42 bottles each minute, meaning that in a day, Dippity Doo can produce 60,000 bottles of hair gel. Wow. Those bottles head down a conveyor to be capped by factory workers. The caps are then punched on securely by this machine. Tomari's in charge of the punching. How do you Dippity Doo, Tomari? My hair is too long, so I can't really put Dippity Doo on it. Next up, labeling, courtesy of Cirilla. There we go. <laughs> Cirilla is here to tell us that labeling is no laughing matter. I'm very serious about my labels. Labels are distributed from long rolls. A back label gives a list of ingredients and instructions. And then a front label gives the name, quantity, and strength of the gel. After labeling, the bottles head through a date stamper. Then the gel is hand boxed, palletized, 
and sent out to dippity doo devotees across the country. To do what? Whoa, I mean, where do I start? You've got your hipster tousled, then your hipster mohawk, hipster spikes, hipster side part, hipster no part with quiff, hipster tousled spikes. Again? Hipster forward comb. That one reminds me of someone. Hipster center part. Yep, my great aunt Emily. And then the classic tousled hipster quiff with mohawk inspired side part. Yeah, I'm out. Okay. You want to know what I find puzzling? What? Why is it so much fun to spend hours fitting interlocking pieces of colorful cardboard together? Well, to find out, we're headed to Buffalo Games' 85,000 square foot facility in Buffalo, New York, where they can manufacture over 25 million puzzles and games each year. And this is Paul Dedrick, the president of Buffalo Games, here to tell us why people do puzzles. There's many reasons why people do puzzles. Some people do them to relax, some to expand their mind, some to share time with their family. That sounds serious. Yeah, we take our fun seriously here at Buffalo Games. We have people that can create fun, market fun, and produce fun. That last piece will always be there, okay? <laughs> the first step in creating fun is to select the image. Someone's gonna spend 10 or 15 hours looking at this image. It's got to be wonderful. And that's why we're going to see how Buffalo Games' Wonders of the World Thousand Piece Puzzle is made. A thousand pieces? Some people are fanatics, and maybe they can finish a thousand piece puzzle in one evening. Whoa, how do they do that? There's just no one right way to do a puzzle. Every way is the right way. But there's only one right way to make a Buffalo Games puzzle. The prints are checked to make sure they're not sticking together, and then they're loaded face down into the gluing machine. And this is Michael. He's got the stickiest job in the factory. This is technically the first part of the puzzle. I see what you did there. <laughs> Buffalo Games makes their puzzles with all natural glue. It starts out as a solid and is then melted in this handy drum. They go through 30 tons of glue in a year. So how does this machine work, Michael? Basically, the artwork comes through a set of glue rollers, and then it actually comes down the belt. A board will come across gets mounted on top of that. By the time it gets to the end of the machine, it gets clamped between two rollers, press it down, which becomes our finished product, our artwork mounted on our puzzle board. The puzzle boards are made out of 100% recycled cardboard, thick enough to hold its shape so the pieces click together exactly. Two pieces that can look so similar will not fit, and you know when you have that perfect fit. After gluing, the uncut puzzle boards are first set aside to dry for 48 hours. What are we gonna do while we wait? Well, let's go see what else is going on around here. Oh, uh, over on this machine, the lids for the puzzle boxes are being labeled. The label has a picture of the finished puzzle so puzzlers know what they're buying. The lids are stacked and put on a conveyor belt on their way to packaging. Ah, uh, this is great and all, but I really, really, really want to see some serious puzzle cutting action. Well, then it's a good thing Buffalo Games has a stack of Wonders of the World puzzles printed and glued two days ago. Yay! As they dry, the puzzle boards can curl a bit, so before being loaded into the cutting press, the edges are bent very slightly. It also makes it easier for the pusher blade to grab onto each board. This is Don. He's gonna tell us about the cutting process. The press operates like a giant cookie cutter. It's about a 750-ton cookie cutter. Well, it cuts about 50 million Wonders of the World puzzle pieces in a year, and it's terrifying. It is, it's very scary. Just like Don. I get that a lot. <laughs> the board actually gets cut twice, along the horizontal axis and one on the vertical to make sure all the cuts are clean. If you have a clean cut, the pieces are all crisply defined. They break apart properly, so when the consumer buys the puzzle, they have a thousand pieces, not a thousand piece puzzle that's already half put together. So cutting is the most critical thing we do. And to double check that each piece has been properly cut, the sliced and diced board heads over a backlit conveyor belt. A computer takes a photo of the puzzle and checks to see how much light is shining through. If there's too much light, that means a piece is missing and the computer stops the presses. Stop the presses! Just kidding, I've always wanted to say that. I think you're having too much fun. Well, well you're not the boss here, are you? You can't create fun products without having fun. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. The cut boards are fed into this tumbler, which uses rotating beaters to separate all the pieces. 
A vacuum in the tumbler sucks away all the dust from cutting. Then, the pieces fall into the bottom half of a packaging box. A conveyor belt takes them to a factory worker, who puts on the lid and sends them on their way to be sealed. Then, the puzzle boxes are stacked onto skids and stored in the warehouse, ready to be shipped to... Uh, where should they be shipped, Paul? Every house and every home in North America should have one of our puzzles because we make the best puzzles in the world. They shouldn't just have one, though. They should have many of them. So puzzlers everywhere can enjoy puzzling out the problem of the perfect fit. Yeah, so here's my next problem. Uh, what would that be? How do I get you to stop making puzzle jokes? Now that's a real puzzler. And we're done.